And we're live, episode 58 of the Pop Culture Podcast. Dean Bertram is with us this week. Dean is the festival director of the Midwest Weird Fest and host of the Talking Weird Podcast. Is that right, Dean? That's right. Thanks for having me, guys. I'm really yeah. hyped about being on tonight. Oh, yeah. thanks for having us. Yeah, and Chris, did you know that when you scheduled this podcast three hours ago, you it's already on YouTube, searchable? I, yeah, I know that. But so I was I was trying something different out. Usually we get the stream up and going about 15 minutes before the show. I thought maybe we'll get more viewers if we oh. promote it a little bit ahead of time. So I don't know. we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. Cool. So a lot of weird stuff going on in the news this week. Of course, you know, Russia and Ukraine. I don't know how much we really want to talk about it. but uh, I think anything we say will be outdated by tomorrow. Yeah, there's, a, there's an interesting, <laughs> interesting video I want to share. Let me pull it up here uh, from Memology. He's a YouTuber, but he can you hear that. Yeah. Here we go. But October we're looking 21st. at a giant war in February right now. Currently, that's the projections with the top people on the earth who claim they're not with uh, the New World Order Combine. It is war in February. And this is the type of time, like right before World War One, right before World War Two, when everything kicks off. The prophecy is true. When Alex Jones is right again, I don't know. That's kind of <laughs> ominous. Alex is like the man in the high castle. You have to listen right. to it. Right. Yeah, that's, I don't know. Don't know. Don't know what's going to happen. But uh, Yeah, those conspiracy theories, we're running out of them. They're all coming true eventually. Yeah, there's a, I just actually saw an article about conspiracy theories that are actually true. I'll, I'll pull it up. We'll go through it. Yeah, there's like 50 of them. And I don't know. He gets a little out there, but Alex Jones does hit the nail on the head sometimes, so it's worth twenty conspiracies. I I trust CNN. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Operation Snow White: A criminal conspiracy by the Church of Scientology to infiltrate the government. Oh, well, that was true. Apple deliver deliberately slowing down their phones. That was true. Mm -hmm. Johnson and Johnson aware of asbestos asbestos in their products. The multifaceted silencing of Britney Spears via conservatorship. Wow. Industry is silencing scientists and studies that went against their products. Oh, yeah. Sounds familiar. <laughs> There's well, one. I want to pull up one. Okay. I thought it was just this one. The time Mark Zuckerman had his camera and headphone jack covered way before Snowden's NSA disclosure. So he knew what was going on. <laughs> It wasn't a conspiracy theory. They're watching us. They always have. My it. dad is big on them, and I used to laugh at him when I was a kid. He used to say, "Don't be on the phone with your credit card. That TV's listening to you." And he said something stupid like, "I was doing something," and this was over a decade ago. Well, I think we still had two TVs, so maybe two decades ago. And now, like on CBS News, you'll see reports: uh, hackers can get into your TV. Don't say anything around it. Like, don't use your credit oh, card yeah. around. It's like, yeah, he was right. Yeah, He's well, your, some... phones, your phones are always listening to you. You know, you ever like uh, talk about something totally random like uh, sex lube, and then all of a sudden yeah. you, get, you get ads for sex lube all over Facebook. Uh -huh. and... We'll do it on a show. Yeah. All of a sudden it'll be, I don't even have a motorcycle. Somebody else around me was talking about handlebar parts, and I'm getting offered. Yeah. Yeah. So they're, they're all, we're always being monitored. That doesn't surprise me. So another story that's going on, and I just shared this with Tom, but I don't know, I don't know how to feel about this. Is uh, Victoria's Secret just announced they're utilizing a Down syndrome model? Uh, I I don't know how to feel about this. What are your thoughts, Tom? My thoughts on it are that is such a horrendous industry that I don't want my sister, daughter, niece, anybody being a model. So if you take someone who may be cognitive slower in an industry full of creeps trying to take advantage of people. I mean, she's got to have uh, an agent that's got to be like a family member or somebody you trust. You can't she, just she is hand a her off. She is a professional fashion model, not just a okay. secret model. She, she does this for a living. But it's only her? To... 
Does they she... want to be more inclusive. Yeah, they're, they're take, they were taking a lot of flack for not being inclusive. So I like, want to oh, know yeah. what her exact thing. Model. Does she have an agent or is she her own agent? Does she book what's her wrong? own stuff? Well, I, I don't know. I don't know. I'm sure I'm sure she is an adult. I don't know what's wrong with it. I don't, I know don't like she, the industry. Are they, you know, are they trying how to many models get swallowed up and spit out the bottom of the porn industry? Because yeah. they didn't make it as a model, you know. I think yeah, but it becomes a question of exploitation, and if the person is less able to make a decision in a situation that they mightn't be comfortable in, that somebody who's more cognitively aware would be able to make that decision, you know. Like, is is she going to be cognitively aware enough to go? I don't want to do that shoot; it's too risque, for example. Or or is it or are her parents or her agent there calling that shot? I mean, there is a creep value to it or a creepiness value. That's for sure. Yeah, that's true. Is she is she doing this all of her own free will, or is she being told to do this? Able yeah, it's to like consent. those it's like those child pageant things, which are always so distasteful oh, because yeah. parents roll out their kids. And I mean, is this is this the same thing? If if her intellectual development is the same as I don't know, maybe a ten year old or something. I'm not sure. I'm not a medical doctor, so I can't say what the years are. Are you are you able to make? those decisions in an, in an industry which is known for a, a level of, I suppose, exploitation and creepiness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I guess if she's an adult can make her own decision, she can be a porn star if she wants, right? <laughs> Do you think that's where this is going to lead for? Probably. A lot of models, yeah. Well, yeah, I'm not going to argue that. That's true. Softcore, maybe not whether... her exactly. Maybe not her herself, but it could. I mean, it, it could if it extends out. There could be other people who are in different categories of mental disablement being taken advantage of. If it becomes, and if a you thing. can think of it, it's a category of porn. It's a fetish. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like I said, I don't. I don't know how I should. You know, I don't know how I should feel about it. How does the media want me to feel about it? Am I supposed to be attracted, sexually attracted to this woman? Am I supposed to say, "Yeah, brave. That's brave." I don't know. Yeah, Molly says like there like there is a wide spectrum range for Down syndrome, but so many are functional members of society. Maybe, yeah, but you get the Harvey Weinstein creeps that are like, if you want the job, you're gonna. And a lot of models don't talk about that side of stuff they've done to get ahead. Until they made it all the way, you know, that's when stuff starts coming out. But the grind to the top is. You probably do some stuff you don't want to do as a model still, unfortunately. For sure. Yeah. And I think with Harvey Weinstein, we only know the tip of the iceberg with how deep that went, you know, other things that he did. Super creepy dude. Yeah. Absolutely. Super creepy dude. Well, speaking of movies, you know, the Academy Awards is in the news too, because yes. they are dropping, well, they're not dropping, but they're not televising eight of the categories. Which are <clears throat> major awards. Major. Yeah. Oh yeah. Big, big awards. Editing. I mean, come on. Um, a lot of the Academy members are giving them backlash. Well, yeah, that's what they've always dreamed of. And now you, you shifted, you know, when I was what? a kid, we got to see these awards, but, and then I wanted to be a film editor and then I'd go up there and you're putting me on the pregame show with Terry and Howie in the booth. <laughs> you know, I, I don't get to walk down there and have them shine the light in my eyes. Cause I'm crying too much. Thanking my mom. I get the shaft. Come on. And you just ended up being a porn fluffer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. Um, yeah, so their plan is they're going to do the awards before the broadcast premieres. And then throughout the the, broad, the shortened broadcast, they're going to uh, play clips of the acceptance speeches. But they, these awards are not going to be going to be going to be presented live. Uh, I honestly, I don't care. I'm not why I'm definitely not watching the oscars this year i don't think i watched it last year i don't care anymore the main reason that i'm not watching the oscars this year is because of this i can't stand any of these women i don't know where they thought this was a good idea amy schumer hosting the academy awards get the fuck out of here amy schumer is the most annoying human being on the planet she's a joke thief she steals other people's jokes she's not funny she's annoying i am not yeah. watching the oscars because of this if you I heard one of Amy Schumer's jokes, you heard them all. Yeah, well, she's it's about her she vagina. Blatantly steals jokes from other comedians. It's go on YouTube, look up Jamie Schumer joke thief. You'll see. Yeah, videos galore of her just stealing, stealing. Thank you, Molly. Molly can't stand her either. 
Um, you know, Mod Wanda Sykes, I don't care for her. I don't know who Regina Hall is. Maybe I like her, but I'm, I can't watch it because of, uh, Amy Schumer, you know, and don't, aren't the Academy Awards supposed to be about film? You know what? They what got happened? rid of hosts for two years. Now they're bringing them back. I, I guess. Yeah. I don't know. But uh, what, what has Amy Schumer done for the film community? What has she done on film? I think she's made some flops maybe, but what has she done? Like Bob Hope was a good Oscar host. Billy Crystal was a good Oscar host. No, I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I think that the Academy Awards are just going downhill, downhill. <sighs> You need to get rid of all the other and just keep one film award show televised. You don't need the Golden Globes and on the TVs with the Emmys. And I always make fun of Molly because she likes to watch the Country Music Awards, but they're on every other month. <laughs> right? <laughs> what is going on? I didn't know Molly liked country and western music. That's yeah, she does. It's. No. I make her keep her stations on 11 and 12 at numbers on her dial in the car. Does she like that? <laughs> There's like six stations not even programmed to get to her stations. I put them all the way over Does there. she like that uh, that stupid uh, bougie like Applebee song? I don't even know what it is. I heard it once. And I'm like, no. No. no I, don't, I don't know. Oh, that reminds me. Let me, I want to, speaking of Ukraine, share another video with you. Uh-oh. Yeah. Let me make this bigger. So, CNN was covering. Oh, I saw um, this. Yeah. <laughs> did you see this? C CNN was covering the uh, invasion of Ukraine and uh, very serious, very serious, somber sight here. Air raids going off. Oh, no, I didn't see this one. I Watch. Think. Oh, yes, I did. Nothing like Applebee's in the middle of a crisis. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Talk about bad timing. Did you see the drone that they had? No. They had a drone following that camera around. It's a, I guess it's a running joke in Russia about garage for sale. Okay. <laughs> it's something anytime you can use it, like your property's so crap, you, you have to sell the garage to get any money or something. It's like a <laughs> cultural joke. But somebody's trying to sell their garage in Ukraine. That was, I just thought was <laughs> kind of funny. Nice. Hey, who wants to buy a garage? The Russians are bearing down on us. Keep a sense uh, of humor. Well, Dean, why don't you tell us about Midwest Weird Fest? Sure. Yes. Okay. Let's get on topic here. I'm so, I'm so far out of the news loop at the moment, to be honest, guys. I've been buried under it, as, as you guys know. Chris, you are Christian, blessed, that... dude. That's, you should be happy. The news is... Sorry, what was that? You should be thankful. The news is just garbage right now. You're yeah. I mean, I I, I think I, I envy you for not knowing. Somebody this morning was like, "Russia invaded the Ukraine." I'm like, "Oh, really?" <laughs> I've been so out of the news cycle. I have no idea. Um, no Midwest Weird Fest. Yeah, it's bearing down next weekend, not this coming weekend, the following. So March four to six in the Micon Cinema in downtown Eau Claire, where we've been for the last six years. And I love Eau Claire. It's that college town atmosphere. It's absolutely perfect for a fest and I, I mean i've been running fests for almost two decades now and i've never been at a festival never been at a cinema as nice as the mic on as far as how receptive they are and that whole alamo draft house type thing they have where you can have your food bought to you and your drinks bought to you there it's the perfect setup for a festival particularly a genre festival where people want to binge midnight style movies but they don't just start at midnight they run all day that's one of the yeah. fun things about programming a festival like this every slot's like your midnight slot really do you have a midnight movie no we have a 10 we actually finish at midnight we have a, we have 10 o'clock slots at yeah we, we used to do midnight movies and we don't do those anymore yeah. i did them in sydney sometimes but it's yeah it's, it's exhausting and also yeah. It's something I think it's you know it's if your whole festival is a midnight movie, <laughs> you know it seems to be. I don't really. I, I can remember one yeah. year I won't say I had a filmmaker. I think in year two at Midwest Weird Fest going, you really should program my film in the last slot. It's that kind of late night movie where everybody's been drinking, and I'm like every movie I program at the festival is almost <laughs> that kind of movie. So I can't promise you the late night slot. I'm sorry, man. Do you remember when movies used to have their premieres at midnight on like Thursday nights? Mm -hmm. I used to love that going to move, midnight movies, you know, sneak previews. That was awesome. That was a good time. Yeah. I miss going to the cinema. I mean, I don't go to the cinema. I, a, I have a six year old daughter, which I have primary placement of. So it doesn't give me a whole lot of time to be going to 
to late night movies or child inappropriate movies. And and secondly, I, for somebody who programs a film festival, this is probably pretty bad to say. I'm just so dissatisfied with mainstream modern content. I have so like if I don't want to see Avengers eight or Spider Man twelve. I just don't. I've seen. I've been on that thrill ride. You know what I mean. I've been to the park. I've ridden that ride a bunch of times. I don't need to get on that ride every time Hollywood tells me they have a new tent pole featuring that ride again i mean i don't and i you i was the biggest fanboy on the planet when avengers first screened on the big screen tears were rolling down my face you know i was so excited but you can't keep that level of excitement up for what hollywood produces anymore so rarely it's not like they never that's not like never does a film come to a cinema near me i want to see but it's so rare these days i, I miss that excitement i used to have about going to the the cinema that's why i love film festivals i can still go to a festival mine or somebody else's and be super excited about the content because it isn't this cookie cutter you know opening weekend movie where you've got to make all of your money in that first week and that's what really matters and let's promote the heck out of it with what uh, uh as a, a trailer that looks like a, an advanced video game and that'll get in all the kids. Like I'm just bored. I'm so frustrated with the whole scene, to be honest. Yeah. But you, uh, we're running into this problem having a film festival is do you do a ton of screening beforehand? Cause I know for our, our film festival, we have 196 movies sitting on deck that we got to watch before October. So mm -hmm. it, yeah, that's we had gotta to be hard to fill yeah. in to get to a, hollywood movie when you got those well that's another thing too we had several hundred submissions this year we had a record year it was a big year and i spent most of my time watching content this year was <laughs> watching films submitted to the festival but again that that's so much more entertaining to me than going to see the latest thing hollywood tells me is the the movie of the season that I've got to see, you know, I'd much rather discover some filmmaker who's make his, his feature debut and then have the opportunity of world premiering it at the festival. Like this amazing movie we're playing this year called hair trigger, which is a film out of uh, the, all the filmmakers I think went to like college together in Minneapolis. I think most of them are based in Minneapolis and it's like this Quentin Tarantino, Texas Chainsaw Massacre mashup. It's like, imagine if Tarantino had decided to do two Texas Chainsaw Massacre when he was doing Reservoir Dogs and combine the two. And it sounds like, oh, that's, you know, somebody trying to paint by numbers, but it's not. It works so well. It works as a crime caper. It works as a horror movie. It works as a period piece because it's set in the 90s. Hollywood just doesn't offer me that kind of new way of looking at things very often. I mean, you can take old projects or, or old ideas and play with them and, and meld them and, and mash them up. That's, that's exciting genre filmmaking to me. Yeah. You know, and you've got these films like the green Knight and even the last duel, even nightmare alley, they all bombed at the box office, all amazing films, but they bombed at the box office. The top five out of the top six movies last year were, were all comic book movies. And uh, the, the fifth was like the Fast and the Furious 9. So people just aren't going to see these movies, unfortunately. And I just, yeah. I hope that we can keep getting these more independent movies being released in the theaters and not just the popcorn flicks and action movies. Well, I think do you, you think there's that, a... Chris, oh, sorry, you go, Tom. Oh, I was just thinking, do you think there's like some sort of stigma to these big comic book movies that you have to th see it in the theater but they're kind of hurting the smaller movies like you don't have to see this movie in the theater type thing yeah probably i think that's also the pressure to book it like if you're a cinema particularly the few independent cinemas left like micon that we do it at i'm sure that the booker says to them or whatever the equivalent of a booker is these days well we you know we want to give you spider-man and avengers and and if you're a smaller cinema and you know you're going to be have a successful weekend by running the latest marvel movie are you going to take a chance on something else where it's you're not you're going to play and that's i think you were saying it chris when if i recall when we were both on um, or when i was on um the doctor destruction show uh what's it called uh, area 50 area 51 uh, is that I, I forget it anyway it's a wonderful show that's a plug for dr destruction what a great show uh, on amw lip anyway as you mentioned i think as long as people keep going to see these movies hollywood's gonna keep making these movies and it's this juvenilia this i mean okay i was a fanboy way too far into my adult life and a part of me still is a fanboy but how long do you want to just be entertained by superheroes beating each other up? And I'm this is coming from somebody who's a fanboy. By the time I was, I still liked it by the time I hit my 20s, but I was more interested in going and seeing a Quentin Tarantino movie or a Spike Lee movie or, you know, the people who were, who were, 
I suppose the cutting edge of that Hollywood cinema in the late eighties, early nineties. I wasn't, I was, I was much more interested to see that than a Tim Burton Batman movie. I saw the Tim Burton Batman movie as well, but my point is I, my taste had grown. It seems like everybody's taste today is stunted. It seems like they go from their teens and they stay in that juvenilia and they just want to keep consuming it. And I don't know if it's just because of great marketing, but aren't people getting bored? Good grief. I would have thought that the bubble would have burst already on comic book movies, but I was wrong. They're yeah. stronger than ever. I mean, I don't know. Man, I was ranting about this like three or four years ago, and I'm still ranting about it. So maybe I thought it was going to fizzle after Endgame when the Avengers finally wrapped up. I thought that was going to be pretty much it. Man, I couldn't even get through the last half of that. I, I watched the first one and the second one. I didn't, I didn't oh, even Dr. Dr. watch it. Dr. Destruction, hello. Um, yeah, no, I saw the first part of Endgame and I didn't even bother to go. This, I was so exhausted by then. It was like, I don't want to ride Space Mountain again. I know this ride, man. Oh, wait a minute. Who can watch 21 <laughs> movies and not see the conclusion I didn't on the 22nd? <laughs> My stamina was, had had it. I was just like... <sighs> And it's not that well, I didn't, I'm not saying I didn't enjoy them. I was just like, I just don't want to get on that roller coaster again, man. I've, I've it's like it. when Forrest Gump quit running. You just <laughs> stop. <laughs> man, you guys needed to come to my door and convince me to come back into the game. <laughs> like, where you are just you, see Forrest? the last one. It was 21 build up to the 22nd movie. And you're like, eh, I don't know. Yeah. Well, the one thing I know that we have to look forward to, and I know everybody's looking forward to, especially the doctor, Dr. Destruction, Nicolas Cage is Dracula. Oh, my I do like Cage. Oh, I mean, everybody. I like him too. I like him. Do the Doc Cage. No, I just watched okay. Con Air, and that was a good movie despite yeah. Nicolas Cage. <laughs> <laughs> you know, a great movie I watched again. I bought it this Christmas, actually, because I, I hadn't seen it for a few years, was The Family Man. The kind of the cage does kind of Capra, you know, it's like a, a, in a weird way, a very strange modernization of It's a Wonderful Life, kind of told in the reverse way you know somebody who has everything and then realizes they missed out on that family life instead that's it i think that's one of the greatest overlooked nicholas cage movies i think he's just i think he's a when he, he he can hit so many right notes and sometimes he has to do these extreme type movies we're used to him doing now you know these nutty over the top movies but he was actually a pretty strong romantic comedy dramatic actor back in the day that movie yeah. will make you cry man i watched that movie tears running down my face okay I don't, it's I worse, it's I worse than watching it. the new Avengers. It'll make me cry even more. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> I, saw I saw that in the theater. Yeah, I remember that movie. Chris I like Crazy Nicholas Cage. I like that Crazy Nicholas Cage. What? You I like see movies. everything. Everything in the theater. Not everything. I didn't see uh, Nightmare Alley in the theater because that only played for a week at my theater. He's Literally. a big shot. He took me to a movie one time and his name was on a seat. <laughs> <laughs> and it said guest. Next yeah, you were my guest. Yep. And you guys oh, should okay. come up to Midwest Weird Fest. We're going to come into somewhere as a guest. Yeah, we should make a trip up yeah. to uh, You guys to should come up to Eau Claire next, next weekend. weekend. Or... Yeah. And I'm putting you on I've, the spot. I've been to uh, Eau Claire. I liked it when I was there. I had a good what time. What were you doing in Eau Claire? I was getting an award for, like, greatest president of an honor society ever. So I had to go there for, like, a three-day Phi Theta Kappa award oh. ceremony. I'm impressed, Tom. Yeah, I have an award. Why haven't why isn't that proudly displayed in your home? Why haven't I seen this award? It's in the college. They have it in a sure it is. <laughs> it is. It's in the college. It your your is. award is in the college. Yeah, it was Phi Theta Kappa's award. It's at the college. I'll take you there one day so and it, show it's, you. It's, if you win the NCAA tournament, you don't get to take the trophy home. They keep it at the school. You got a you got a ring though, don't you? Did you get a ring? I could have bought a ring, but I didn't want to buy a ring. <laughs> they make you pay for it. They didn't give me a ring. Oh well, gosh. <clears throat> okay, so you you, I believe, <laughs> believe you. You got an award. I did. If I want to see your award. I have to go to the college, right? Yes. I'll go take a picture of it. <laughs> you don't even have a picture of it. No, they mailed it out. It was the end of the year. <laughs> they mailed it, and I was done with college. Yeah, I got an award too. <laughs> it's there. It's the coolest that's dude it. ever. I'm, yeah, I'm getting Dr. <laughs> Selby. <clears throat> coolest dude ever awarded. It's, uh, it's at UW Milwaukee. Yep. <laughs> now they give awards to 
kids just for showing up, right? Like attendance awards, oh, yeah. And yeah. best friend award, and like they just they just invent these awards. I think they, they didn't do that when I was a kid. I didn't get many awards. <laughs> <laughs> there weren't many to give out, man. Back in the day, <laughs> they didn't have that many. Never. I don't. Did I ever? I don't. The only thing I ever remember winning anything was. Uh, in eighth grade, I think I, I, yeah, I won Optimus Prime because I spent like 50 bucks on these lottery tickets they were doing at the very end of the year. And I won an Optimus Prime toy. That's the only thing I remember winning as a kid. It's a cool. That's not cool an prize. award. That's a prize. Fuck you. It's an award. It's not I got an award. It's an award. You didn't Did you get, get him something bronzed? better than anyone else. I should have gotten him bronzed. Yeah. I played the fuck out of that thing. <laughs> Check out my fancy award. <laughs> It's a prestigious award, Chris. We believe you. You want you, here? You want to see something? Yeah. Oh boy, here he goes. That's it. I'm running to the college. Dean, you take over the show. I'm <laughs> break this thing and get my award. This, this is a real award. Let's see if I can get out of that. Pace Center, Milwaukee Independent Film Society. Oh, nice for advancement of independent film in Wisconsin. Oh, nice. That's my name. Whoa, that is a pace award. setter award. Good job, Chris. I knew that didn't have to do with running. <clears throat> I can run, it's not very far. Anyway, uh, let's talk about your podcast too. You do a podcast, team. Yes, sure. I do a podcast with my girlfriend and co host Jen Durrell. We do it every Saturday night at 11 p.m., mainly because I need to make sure that my daughter is definitely settled. <laughs> and you do it at 9, she might wake up, you do it at 11, she's she's down for the night. But we And it, that show's mainly about paranormal type things, UFO, Bigfoot, you know, ghosts, extraterrestrials, all the, you know, the typical stuff. But we do do weird film as well. So we'll have filmmakers on or TV producers on who do paranormal type content. But it normally has to fit that kind of you know, that paranormal angle, I suppose. That's, how, that's actually how I met Tom. I was in a paranormal group. I was a paranormal investigator. And uh, oh, wow. Tom's studio is haunted. They called our group out. We were on, we went on the podcast and we did a little investigation. Get yeah. out. Yeah. yeah, I'm so desperate for friends. I'll fake a haunting and call it <laughs> paranormal group. <laughs> yeah, I've, been, I've been a paranormal investigator for over 10 years now. Uh, Gosh, Chris, we're going to get you on Talking Weird then. I did oh, not yeah. know that. Yeah, I've been I've been all over the country. You name it, I've been there. Wow! We've got one of my friends coming on on the radio program, Dennis, who was in my other group. So, but he's going to be on the radio. He's in a paranormal investigator too. So, fantastic! This week on Area Ten Fifty One is going to be all about ghosts. Wow. I'll have to I'll have to try to tune in between crazy festival work. But no, we should definitely get you on. You love Midwest Weird Fest because we had we did actually Dakota Layden before Dakota Layden was um known before he did trail what it what what's the it's um i get them confused because we played his first film which was trail to terror and then he did that was his launch pad to do destination fear on the travel channel and now i think the travel channel are finally showing six wow. seven years later they're showing that the, initial the travel film channel we, is only only yeah. paranormal now that's it now that's it seems all it be. is it wow, seems that's what people watch just like the yeah. comic book movies, that's what people watch. And you'd love this year the Alien Abduction Answers uh, world premiere that we have, featuring Whitley Strieber and uh, with the director John Yost in attendance to Q and A, who's also an experience. The the film, in many ways, he and Strieber are the two, I guess, featured people in the show. Although there are other abductees, there's a how I found out about the show. We'd had this uh, wonderful regular attendee at the festival, Alana Rebellia, been coming for years. I think since year one or year two. And she just happened to send me a trailer one day saying, hey, you might recognize some faces in this. And I'm watching the trailer. And there's Whitley Strieber. I'm going, well, I recognize that face. And then she's in there. And I'd known her for like, you know, literally at least five years. I had no idea she was an abductee. So, yeah, that's a, I'm, I'm really happy that we get to world premiere that at the fest this year too. That's nice. Cool. Yeah. Uh, this, this past Saturday on the show, we had a friend of mine, Jared, who I met at a paranormal group again. He had a close encounter a uh, very close encounter uh, with a giant, giant ship. He's, he's talking like this thing was miles long. It was wow. giant. Yeah. And that was in northern Wisconsin and kind of in your neck. neck Gosh. Place. Do you. <laughs> yeah. Dr. Destruction's only ever heard me talking. He's never seen yeah. me talking. 
I, I'm, I have a I have a radio face, I think. Um, <laughs> anyway, I, if I could just ask you, Chris, as somebody who's a paranormal investigator, and you're obviously also to a degree interested in the UFO phenomenon, or you've spoken to people who've had that experience. Oh, do you do you see a connection between the two? Do you see like there are those there are those the type of theorists, and I'm guess kind of one of them who who tends to to look at much of the paranormal under a broader blanket. I see parallels between hauntings and alien abduction and cryptid accounts but is that something you've seen in your research yeah, definitely definitely especially between between ufos and cryptids i think there's a there's a huge connection i mean people have claimed to have seen bigfoots coming out of ufos mm -hmm. so actually one of my questions this week that i posed was do you think bigfoot could be like a probe you know it could be a scout for future aliens to come and visit us you know like you, you ever see the movie signs where the yeah. mm -hmm. recruiters talking to, talking to joaquin phoenix's character and he's like i, I know what these are these are these are scouts these come in before the main force, you know, could Bigfoot be something like that? I don't know. I mean, it's there's, possible. There's Stan Gordon's book called, I think it's called is silent invasion. I got on the bookshelf back there somewhere, but he did a lot of um, coverage of this big UFO plus cryptid or Bigfoot flap, I think in Pennsylvania in the 1970s, where people were regularly having these very strange paranormal type experiences with Bigfoot. In other words, they were shooting at them and the Bigfoot was just disappearing in a flash of light or a UFO would land on the back 40 and out of it would come three Bigfoot. Like there seemed to be yeah. that real parallel or that real um, combination of the two phenomena. Have you heard about the Bigfoot that are seen with the, like the metal orbs next to them? Mm-hmm. I've heard I've heard talk of it, yeah. Joshua Cooch has written a couple of great books with Timothy Renner too, called Where the Footsteps Where the Footprints End, rather, Where the Footprints End. And it, he he does parallels with everything from tales of witches to fairy uh, lore to UFO type stuff to, you know, looking at the more esoteric aspects of Bigfoot sightings that you probably wouldn't normally get on a finding Bigfoot example, which tends to approach it like they're just flesh and blood, wild, you know, ape man or or mm -hmm. or, or an undiscovered breed of North American ape. Kuchin and Renner's study seems to suggest, and so does other people's in the field, including Stan Gordon's, seems to suggest that these things mightn't be flesh and blood. It doesn't dismiss them as not being real, but if they're flesh and blood, they don't seem to be flesh and blood in perpetuity. Maybe they come and go. Like a lot of the Native American traditions talked about Bigfoot type creatures or Sasquatch type creatures, that they were of this world and of another world. Somehow they could you know, go in and out between the realities. And I, I tend to lean a little more to that because otherwise I can't believe we don't have a body and I can't believe how many people have shot at Bigfoot that we don't have bodies left and right. I mean, there's an awful lot of people are shot at Bigfoot in this country. Every second person has got a gun, you know, like it's just unbelievable that there is the dead Bigfoot. Yeah, for sure. Um, I actually posed a question too, not long ago. I was like, we haven't, have we ever gotten pictures recently of Bigfoot? Like Bigfoot's kind of gone silent i think you know same thing with like the devil's triangle you never hear about people vanishing in the devil's triangle again i think there are there are pictures of bigfoot and video of bigfoot but you're right it's more on the down low it's not as culturally prominent as when i guess the 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 patterson gimlin footage was on every tv screen back in the 70s when i was growing up watching in search of and you know various other you know monster movies and the, I'm, when i say monster i mean cryptid type movies they didn't really call them cryptids then they were you know you, yeah. you'd watch a monster movie it would be bigfoot this and the loch ness monster and you know something else it wouldn't be it wouldn't mean necessarily Frankenstein and Dracula and the Wolfman, but yeah, no, they're still out there. It's just a different, I guess it's, a, it's, it's something we don't see as much on the nightly news perhaps as we used to. Yeah. I just uh, was talking to my dad about Bigfoot and he said this, this is something new. I never heard and come from my dad, he, something he saw, but he was talking about uh, like forest people that are about four feet tall that are kind of in the Bigfoot realm. Could you explain that a little bit or, I mean, I've heard about various, I don't know if I can answer that question. Okay. I've certainly heard of different um, sized hominids and there's ideas sometimes when they see, when somebody sees a smaller hairy humanoid figure, some people who are the flesh and blood type proponents will instantly say, oh, that must be a juvenile Bigfoot that you saw. It was only four or five feet. It must just be a kid. But there were older, there are certainly older fairy traditions about little people that were covered with hair. Even the even when we talk, it's funny because 
my daughter, I think I homeschool my daughter. We were reading from an older fairy tale type book the other day and had a brownie in it. I think the brownie was covered with hair or was very hairy. And when you look at, um, if you pick up a, a, a good old fairy book or, a, and I don't mean fairy tales like Disney Twinkerbell with, Tinkerbell with wings, but if you read some of the older fairy mythologies, there's a great encyclopedia on fairies by Catherine Briggs. You can certainly read about hairy entities in that. In fact, the very first somewhat modern human alien abduction took place in South or Central America to a chap called Villa Boas when he was dragged aboard the spherical type craft and the entities took off their helmets. They weren't your typical greys with the big bulbous heads and the black eyes. They were these diminutive dwarf-like people with long beards and hair. They look more like something out of a fairy tale than out of a science fiction movie. So mm. I, there are certainly tales of shorter hairy creatures for sure in the broader folkloric history as well. You guys aren't from Milwaukee, but did you ever hear of Haunchyville? I have heard. I have heard. Uh, Tom, Only because heard I read Linda Godfrey's book. It rings a bell, but I have no clue what it is. Haunchyville was a legend in Muskego, Wisconsin, uh, just uh, – Oh, the, the little people. Yes. Now I know what it is. Yeah, yes. yeah, on Mystic Drive. And uh, as a kid, man, we were I was terrified, terrified of going there. We'd go there every once in a while and just, you know, look out of our car window. We never we never went in, like, through the woods. Because supposedly through the woods, there was this village of little people living there. And if you went there, the uh, the caretaker, this old farmer, would chase you with a shotgun. But uh, now on Google Earth, you know, we can see everything. I mean, there's nothing Spoils there. it, really. Yeah. She could do a live podcast from Haunchyville. Live from Haunchyville. Oh, that would be awesome. That would be awesome. I'm sure that farmer's <laughs> gone by now. <laughs> well, I don't know. Apparently he's mortal. I don't know. Tom, it's, I think go. it's funny. Speaking of weird stuff and Midwest Weird Fest, it was that book. It was Linda Godfrey's book, Weird Wisconsin, which is where I first read about Haunchyville, which was probably the main instigator of me starting midwest weird fest i heard other stories as well like people would i'd bump into people who said yeah my babysitter was one of the victim one of the children of a victim of ed gain and they gain would just live down and i was like gain lived down the road oh yeah it's just around here i'm like it is too so I, I was and i'd hear all these other weird stories as you do in the area you'd bump into people who were up here squatching or whatever so I, I was conscious of the idea it was weird but reading that book of godfrey's which was just loaded with things like haunchyville and ufo landing point ports and the hodag which i never heard of about before and of course the beast of bray road and just weird thing after weird thing after weird thing that's what triggered my kind of i'd already run horror festivals in sydney and science fiction fantasy festivals in sydney but the idea of doing a broader weird one that incorporated the type of genre I was used to programming, but also documentaries about UFOs and haunted houses and Bigfoot and everything else was directly because of that um, Linda Godfrey book. And I actually, I got to, I got to world premiere um, Linda Godfrey's movie return to wildcat mountain, which was about the black pant, the phenomenon um, to the further to the, to the West when you kind of that kettle moraine type area where there's these, you know, there's these reports of, black cats large black cats that shouldn't be there so yeah it's we a had weird that state reported in slinger in the 90s it was by oh. highway 41 we had a black cat sighting wow but i was just thinking okay if they're not lying they're, i mean somebody just let a panther go yeah. <laughs> wisconsin is is a weird state there's a lot of weird things that go on in wisconsin yeah, oh damn. Well, most uh most people who like do podcasts or have shows on you know, cryptos and paranormal, they've had experiences personal. So, do you have any personal experiences that got you into believing and stuff? Yeah, I have. I do have one and I've told it on my show, so I'll tell it here. I don't talk about it a whole lot, but I will. When I was um when I was a little boy, I'm guessing it's hard to remember because nobody else was there to tell me what age I was, but I was around somewhere between four and maybe seven, probably five-ish, six-ish maybe, but maybe as young as four. It's a very, very early memory, probably closer to actually the lower end of that scale because it's one of my earliest memories. I have this, what I would thought was a recurring dream of this little man who would come and take me away every night. And he wasn't, a, he didn't look like a gray alien. He didn't have big bulbous eyes and he wasn't that stick figure. He was more like 
almost like a midget, which is the politically incorrect term now, but almost like a malevolent looking little man from Freaks or from um or from The Wizard of Oz. Do you know what I mean? He looked like a little, but he he had more of a goblin-esque kind of look to him. He was about my size and he would come and he would physically take me and I would go somewhere very strange, which was a strange illumination. And I remember one time there, there were all these people or things which were much taller than me and the little man. Again, he was about my height of around, around five. And I remember pulling on one of their legs or, you know, coattails because I thought it was my mother for whatever reason. And the thing bent down and its face was inches from me and it wasn't human at all. It was hideous and horrifying. And I don't like trying to describe that face because I've been influenced by science fiction and horror movies for so long. But let's just say it didn't look like us. It was something that was truly inhuman, far more less human than the little man. Anyway, one night that little man came and for some reason I knew with all of my being that if I went away with a little man, I wasn't coming back. I just knew it. And I actually, it sounds silly. I had a fight, like a physical wrestling fight with a little man. And to me, that fight remains ontologically as real as my memories of wrestling boys in the playground when I was that age or getting into fisticuffs when I was a little boy, as little boys do. So I, I remember it very physically and I remember it being exhausting and, you know, hard work and frightening. And then the little man never came back. Now, I tend to lean towards thinking that was something my psyche was going through as a child. I don't think that I was being taken by. No, you kicked his ass, Dean. (laughs) But I I, out of him. He wants no piece of Dean anymore. Apparently not, but it fits fairy parallels and it fits some abduction parallels. I hadn't forgotten about it, but I didn't think about it until the late eighties, early nineties, when books like communion by Whitley Strieber and Bud Hopkins intruders and a book by a psychotherapist type called Edith Theory, which was the first one I read called encounters talked about alien abductions. And when I read it, it was saying things like, have you ever had memories of, you know, little people coming into your bedroom at night? And all of a sudden I was like, man, maybe I was an alien abductee when I was a kid. Now I don't actually, I don't think alien abduction isn't a real phenomenon. I think it's a real phenomenon. I don't think ETs from Zeta Reticula are coming here, taking people away to experiment on them and engage in a breeding program. I think it's something far more complicated than that. But um, but yeah, what my experience was, I don't know. I lean towards it was psychological, but that's the closest I've had probably to an interesting paranormal experience. I mean, like everybody, I've heard footsteps in old houses and, you know, I've seen flashes of lights where there shouldn't have been one, but that's the most personal story I could probably tell you guys. So you're leaning towards alien, alien abduction on that? (laughs) No, I'm still leaning towards my, my subconscious, you know, working something out when I was a child, but I do think there's an imaginal realm and I don't just, I don't mean that like we talk about the imagination at this Mm -hmm. part in our history. And we have for probably close to a hundred years now where it just means it's all in your imagination. You're just imagining it. I think there's a richer, longer esoteric tradition where the imaginal realm is something which we engage with imaginally like it has something to do with our thought processes and our psyche and our ideas idea of archetypes and the like but i don't think that it isn't necessarily doesn't have a component of of objectivity i don't think that there isn't such now it's very subjective as well because we have an input into it but i think it i think to the experience and just like my dream of fighting that little man or my experience of fighting that little man remains in my mind as as a, as physically as real as fighting boys at that age in my life, I think often the experiences that people have, be them alien abduction, be them encountering a Bigfoot in the woods, be them seeing the Virgin Mary in a grotto, whatever it is, I think those things feel real, but I don't think they operate in this existence. I think there's a space in between. And I think that's where we engage them. And what it is, I can't tell you, but I, I, I don't think it's just us. I think there's something else engaging with us. I always believe that the human beings can do a lot more than we think we can do. And I've talked to a lot of people who've done MDMA, the mushrooms, mm-hmm. and they talk about how the mushroom unlocks your mind and allows you to go into different realms. And that's they all what, they I've all have heard. they all have the same stories about spirits helping them deal with their problems 
that they meet God and they all say she's a female. They never, I don't know where this is like, just so many different people that don't know each other all have the same universal experiences mm -hmm. that come through. And it's, it's like, wow, I want to, I, do you, do you know where I can get mushrooms? <laughs> yeah. Is my question. No, I've never done a hallucinogen, but I do know ayahuasca is another one of those things which leads to a communal psychedelic experience or a communal fantasy experience. People who do ayahuasca, I've spoken to people who have, they talk about, they. there's always stories of snakes and, you know, this kind of revelation and traveling down tunnels. And it's a very similar experience, which is interesting because I think, I think a lot of drugs, which are psychedelic, and again, I've never taken a psychedelic, but from my understanding is they're very subjective, the experiences. But yes, there are some that seem to, and some of them have been used ritualistically by various, you know, religions and, and spiritual movements throughout history, which do tend to have somebody travel a similar path to somebody else who takes that. So that's fast. Terence McKenna wrote about that. He was, he talked about people seeing clockwork elves when they did DMT and clockwork elves seemed very much again to be like those gray extraterrestrials that we're talking about. So he said, he would say, I can induce, I can induce an abduction type experience. I can just give you DMT and you're going to see those creatures. So. Yeah. DMT. It's, it's a trip unlike anything else. Um, yeah, that's all I'll say. <laughs> Have you seen the Clockwork Elves, Chris? Uh, no, everybody's trip is a little different. Um, but no, I didn't see Clockwork Elves. If I took it, if I ever did it, <laughs> you know, yeah, we don't need to go there. <laughs> um, Got to get a hold of some mushrooms. I want. But go yeah, no, I, I, I could probably help. Well, I can, maybe I can help you out. Yeah. I don't want to incriminate myself, but you, you let me know. You let me know. Yeah. So I uh, last last uh, this past Saturday on the radio show we had Bob Weiss. Uh, Bob Weiss is the owner of Shaker Cigar Bar, one of the most haunted locations in America, if not the most haunted. And uh, Bob is a gourmet chef. If you don't know Bob or you've never been to Shaker's, he's like a Michelin star level chef. He might even have a Michelin star. I don't know. Is he the but, most easygoing guy on the planet? He is. He's the guy that I would want to narrate my life. You know, forget. Yeah. Morgan Freeman. I want Bob Weiss to narrate my life. He's got this soothing voice that. I mean, it, it's amazing. But anyway, we were talking about Jeffrey Dahmer and cannibals and all this, you know, weird stuff that we always talk about when Bob's on. And uh, I posed a question to him, and I'm going to pose this question to Bob, or not to Bob, but to Dean. If uh, if you were given the choice of a cut of meat from a person, what would it be, and how would you prepare it? Consider this the hot seat, Tom. Good grief. Oh, right. Good grief. That's so we, were, we were talking about Albert Fish, too. I brought up Albert Fish. I don't know if you guys are familiar with him. Gee. Well, I, I, would I, I would want the person to live, so I guess a, a cut off their finger or something. It's a oh, terribly no, humane to, answer. You're going you're gonna, to like, dig in. This has like, got to be a mean, <laughs> a mean well, place. I'm, I'm trying to think of Hannibal. What, did, what was Hannibal's preferred part? Was brain. it like the liver or brain. something? Or oh, liver and brain, right? <laughs> Is yeah. that what he liked? I, well, I didn't think about the liver. I, I told Bob said, well, it depends on the cut of meat. You know, it depends on how I would cook it. And I said, okay. The tenderloins right down the back. Albert Thanks. Fish Albert Fish loved the buttocks. He cut off the buttocks and ate, and he roasted it. He slow roasted it with some carrots, potatoes, onions, you know. Actually, it sounded pretty fucking good, if you're asking me. But... <laughs> yeah, you throw a little brown gravy in there and you get So a... I told Bob, I said, okay, so you get you get, you get get a buttocks. How are you going to prepare that? And he said, well, you know, Albert probably had it right. Probably roasting that is probably the best bet, but you got to make sure you, you season it and you marinate it, you know, open up the oven door and you marinate it every once in a while. So it stays nice and juicy. Okay. Bob. I think they called it long pig in, I was at New Guinea near me. The cannibals, they referred to people as when they ate it, it was long pig. Yeah. Cause it was some commonality between the taste of, I guess, human and pork. Yeah. That's what I've heard. I've, I've not eaten people. But uh, that's that's what I've heard. Tom, what, what's your answer? What cut of meat would you want? How would you prepare it? Well, the the inner back straps. I'm, I'm talking to the fastest Skinner alive. I am the fastest yeah. Skinner alive. That's what they they were so impressed in all my that's cadaver got classes. Awards. Out of college. I know. I'm skinny human. In, inner back straps, just like on a deer. After you get the guts out, there's some nice, you make them with some eggs, soy sauce. You know, I've never skinned a deer. I'd, I'd like to know. I've skinned smaller game. I've skinned rabbits and things. Oh, it's a pain in the ass. I've never done anything big. <laughs> it's just a pain in the ass. 
Well, the question we actually had on the hot seat, the cannibal question was, in an apocalypse, would you rather eat your dog or someone else? Gosh. See, when you put property of your dog. I'd probably eat my dog over a person. Yeah, Yeah, but you don't even know the person. Well, if I don't know the person, I mean, if they're already, are they already dead or would I have to kill them? Yeah, there's a dead body there that you could eat or you could kill your dog. You got to eat. Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. I think I'd still kill my dog. There's so, I, there's a line. There's so, listen. I, I wouldn't in, so in the apocalypse. I, I don't love think my dog have... so much. I eat another person. <laughs> I have a cat. I have a cat, but I, I'd still probably eat my cat first. But... I've skinned cats too. I've never skinned. I've shot at a cat. A, a feral cat in Sydney. I well, not in Sydney, out in the bush. I missed the thing. It had. A, it was so big. It had a rabbit in its mouth. It was big. Whoa. But, uh, yeah. It was big. They have big feral cats out there in rural New South Wales. Goodness gracious. Everything out there is big. Yeah. Yeah. Do dingoes actually eat babies? They might. I certainly oh, know. I was going to ask. They would. I was going to ask David Black that last year. Our guest last week is in Australia right now. Australia. When I was a child, that whole Lazaria Chamberlain thing was, um, yeah. yeah, was was a massive news event in, in Australia. I remember once being in um in class when I would have been, I don't know, I was in primary school. I was probably about 11, maybe 10. And I made some joke because they're all jokes circulating amongst us, you know, as those kind yeah. of jokes, as distasteful yeah. as they are. Of course they circulate. And I think that I remember my teacher and she might've even been the same religion. I think they were, were they Jehovah's witnesses or seventh day Adventists? They were anyway, they were a member of some largest, slightly alternative Christian church, I think, or maybe a sect of that larger church. And I think my teacher might've been as well. And she got in, she was enraged with my Azaria Chamberlain joke, which I, I wish I could remember. I can't. I remember being called out in front of the class and getting into all kinds of trouble. So, yeah, as a child, it was just funny. But I guess on reflection, it was pretty horrific. Yeah, really. When I was a kid, when I was a kid, I was in seventh grade when the Challenger blew up, the Challenger explosion. And we, we told ruthless jokes, you know, hey, how did you know that the, the astronauts had dandruff? Well, they found their head and shoulders. Oh, <laughs> yeah. funny. Yeah, uh, did you see the movie uh, with uh, Meryl Streep? What is it, A Cry in the Dark? No, is that the Azaria Chamberlain yeah. one? I remember it, for, and it had um, it had <clears> the <throat> guy. Sam it, it, sorry, who was it? Sam Neill. Yeah, from um, from Damien Omen Three and Possession. Have you guys seen that film, Possession? What an incredible movie! Yeah, that sounds familiar. I think I did. Yeah, it's, he, it's he saw um, it in the theater. <laughs> Yeah, no, Samuel's great. You know, that's one thing. I listen. I, I'm, I'm Jurassic Park movies to me are like Avengers movies. I've got almost zero interest, but oh, I did yeah. fanboy out a little bit in the new trailer when I saw that they brought back, you know, the original lead characters like Sam Neill and um, Goldblum and what's the what's the female actress? Anyway, it was it was kind of cool to to see that. Yeah, I, I kind of want to see the new one too. Yeah, I might actually see that. I might break my no tentpole movie deal with myself and go and watch that are you going to see the batman because the more trailers i see the less i want to see it chris yeah i, I have my tickets already that's the only real they ten- took oh. the cigarette away from the penguin well you don't know that they really yeah have. it's i just read it today wow uh, you can't smoke that's no big deal come he, on he, he can he can kill people but he can't have a cigarette <clears throat> did he have a that's cigarette right. in batman returns i don't remember oh yeah you had the big like cigarette holder thing I don't know. I have to watch. I have to go back and watch that. I don't, can't. When you're getting to when we get to a stage where, where our villains can't do politically incorrect or unhealthy things, then we're in real trouble. Well, that, then that uh, Emma Stone Corilla movie, she couldn't have her cigarette either, and that was such yeah. an integral part of the character. Disney has mm-hmm. no smoking policy. Uh, supposedly no gun policy, so there's supposedly uh, Indy's not going to have a gun in the next Indiana Jones movie. That's lunacy. Oh my god, yeah. I'm yeah, not seeing it. No, yeah, I have, skull I, was so bad anyway. I mean, I never wanted to see another Indiana Jones movie after that. It was like this is horrible. Yeah, yeah, I'm surprised that I have no interest in that movie. But you know, I'm a huge Indy fan. Didn't like Crystal Skull. I don't know. It was the first Indiana Jones movie that made me want to be involved in film, to be honest. I was at the right age when Raiders came out, and I can remember watching the behind-the-scene making of documentaries. That, Of course, then they weren't on the DVD extras. They were the local, you know network and we only had three networks and one government channel in australia the, one of the local networks played almost as a promo for the movie and watching the behind the scenes stuff i was like man 
I could do this. And I was running around with my dad's, you know, eight millimeter film camera. So yeah, I was a Raiders was a big impact on my life. It was such a spectacular film to see at that age, but yeah, yeah. the new ones, no, no desire. I was, what was I nine or 10 when Raiders came out? Something like that. Indiana yeah, Jones. Temple, age, I was too. Yeah. Temple of Doom is my favorite Indiana Jones movie. I know that's Doom's cool, but I do like, Raiders Raiders. I know not a lot of people would agree with that, but I, don't know. I always watch that one the most. It's, it's dark. It's darker. You know, that's that's what helped get us the PG-13 rating. That and Gremlins. It's a dark movie. It's really good. Ripping a guy's heart out. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Soon Molaram will rule the world. <laughs> I just know that line because it's in the video game. Uh, I would constantly say it over and over again. No, Raiders was awesome. great. I, so, I, I think I like still like the first one the most because of the great scope of it and the idea of this such famous biblical artifact being discovered and the idea you can't let the Nazis get their hands on it. Like there was just all of these big epic, it, it, it was larger in scale. Well, I think Temple of Doom is a great film. There was something about, um, there was something about Raiders, which kind of made the Harrison Ford, Indiana Jones character seem like, even though he was a, a vagabond and you know uh, i guess today we look at him as politically incorrect as some treasure you know you know some grave robber or something but but at the yeah. time the fact that he could still be involved in this bigger cosmic you know kind of situation yeah. to decide the future of the western world it, it, it ticked all the boxes for me as that you know 10 year old boy or however old I was. you heard the me. the fan theory right that about raiders of the lost ark i don't know tell me Ed. oh uh Indiana Jones played zero role in that movie. You could remove him and the movie would have gone exactly the same way and ended the same way without Indiana Jones. I had not heard that. Yeah. When you go back and watch it, be like, oh, everything he did didn't matter here, didn't matter there. This didn't matter. And we don't even need Indiana Jones in the movie. Thanks for destroying my childhood. <laughs> <laughs> That's what Tom does. <laughs> He did nothing of importance in the whole movie. <laughs> he did not do one thing that made any difference anywhere. Goodness. I'm going to watch it again. I was going to watch all the Star Wars movies again, but I'm going to watch all the Indiana Jones movies again. Just watch Raiders of the Lost Ark and go, they're right. You don't need Indiana Jones for this movie. <laughs> Goodness gracious. <laughs> That's great. I'm, I just broke his heart. I'm just very childhood. I became a director for that. <laughs> In the film because of that movie. <laughs> He's destroyed it for me. <laughs> My whole life is useless. <laughs> I, I, I did have a misspent youth and a misspent adulthood for the most part. I mean, gosh, My I was a lie. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> it's all fantasy anyway. Uh, I'm sorry, Dean. I'm sorry. sorry we were Thanks for having nice, me on, guys. Nice conversation. You'll always have those memories, though. Nothing can take that away from you. <laughs> no, those memories are gone now, too. Thanks for coming. It's all just evaporated. Don't worry. We could have done this podcast without you, Dean. <laughs> <laughs> you could have, too. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh Holy crap. Oh, Holy God. Shit. You're right. I even I almost didn't believe you, but you're right. There, that is a theory. You see that? Oh, come on! To see my ad blocker. I gotta yep. jump hoops. Yeah, it is a theory. <laughs> oh my god, it is. If I can, I wish I could get to that stupid article, but yeah, it is a theory. Hmm. Okay. You want? To oh no! Me? This is uh, this is the Raiders of the Lost Ark. Why the indie doesn't matter. Criticism needs to be put in the ground. All right. Oh, you're, now you're you're, you're already safe. defending it. You're not even gonna. <laughs> you're safe, Dean. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a long article. I don't want to read that whole thing. But uh, yeah, some people disagree with you, Tom. Okay. But now you got to go back and watch it. So I I I do I do now. And I was just going to watch The Phantom Menace. Nope. Which, not a bad film. Not a bad film. Going to defend it. Well, this the scary thing is that the prequels 
were were better than the sequels. I mean, I I, I, I could watch the prequels. I started to watch this. I I I think I watched the first sequel and I was like, I can't, I can't, I, I just can't do it. And I was out, same as I was out halfway through the last Avengers movie. I, I so I'm remember. a huge Star Wars fan. I'm a huge Star Wars fan. It's my favorite film franchise. I was so excited when the sequel trilogy was coming. I'm like, yeah, JJ Abrams and fucking lens flare all over the place, all over my face, JJ. <laughs> and it's like, I, I liked it. I liked The Force Awakens. Yeah, it was a rehash of A New Hope, but man, that ended on a cliffhanger, you know, reaching out the lightsaber to Luke, Luke giving that kind of stern look. What, what's going to happen? Oh my God, I got to wait two years to see what's going to happen. Man, The Last Jedi came out. I said, fuck this. I am out. I am out. I walked out of that theater and I said to my friend, I said, I guarantee you, promise you one thing. I promise you one thing. Ryan Johnson will never touch Star Wars again. He will never touch Star Wars again. And have we ever heard anything of his trilogy coming out? Not in five years. I was I was mad. I was really mad. And then Rise of Skywalker came out. I saw that. I'm like, this is so stupid. And it just ruined The Force Awakens. So the whole sequel trilogy is just shit to me. I just can't stand it. Can't stand it. The TV shows are good, though. Ben Mandalorian is a good show. That's a good Star Wars show. Yeah, you know what? I've actually, to be honest, I've seen teasers and snippets from it. It does look good, but I won't. I won't let myself give Disney any money. So there's no, <laughs> there's no Disney on my cable box. Mind you, I don't have the time. But as I was saying before, I don't even have Netflix anymore because they didn't have the time to watch it. What's the point of paying money for when I'm watching 600 submissions instead? I just don't, you know. I've got Amazon Prime because at least that covers my free shipping here. And I yeah. can't even watch anything on that. You know, I don't have the time to watch something I've got, so I'm not paying any other any other um, streaming services. I sound like Scrooge, the Grinch who stole streaming services or something. No, you sound like my wife. My wife is getting after me to cancel some of our automatic memberships that are coming out every month. So I, I see yeah. where you're coming from. And I remember I, when Hulu had some offer once, it was like 99 cents for the year. It was something, maybe 10 bucks for the year. It was some, it was a Christmas offer a couple of years ago, just for, and they were doing it just before Christmas. So I was like, how can I not get this? I'll have Hulu for like 10 bucks. And I'm like, I don't even watch Netflix anymore. Why am I just going to throw $10 away? Like I'm never going to watch it. So no, I, I stopped myself from taking the Hulu as good as that deal was. You know, anyway. Yeah. My kids like Hulu. I've got three teenage daughters. So, uh, I know where you've been. I know, I know what's going on. And uh, I can't watch things until like everybody's in bed. Like I'm up super late at night because that's like the only free time that I have. That's like my me time. You know, if I want to play a video game, watch a movie, watch a show, I got to do it when everybody's asleep. How long is this show, by the way, guys, speaking of children? Uh, we usually go for about an hour, so we can we can wrap things up. I know. No, I was just saying, uh, my, my daughter wandered out. I could go and settle her and then I could um, oh, no, we'll wrap it up, eh? Yeah, we can wrap it up. Yeah, let's uh, get them. Where can we find all your stuff there, Dean? Yeah, if people want to go to midwestweirdfest.com or they can go to charlesfort.org. That has a link to everything. C-H-A-R-L-E-S, the way you spell Charles, and Fort, the way you would spell a Fort, F-O-R-T, charlesfort.org. That links through to Talking Weird, Midwest Weird Fest, everything I do, really. Yeah, the link to Midwest Weird Fest is in the comment section. I put that oh, in thank there. you so much. Just, uh, there you go. just click on that. Look in the comment section and click on that. Man, what a fun show. I have to have you guys on Talking Weed sometime. We can talk. Oh, I'd love to. Yeah, I got a Mothman story. story I'll save for that show. Man, do it. Let's do it. Yeah, I'll get uh, I'll get my friend Jared on, and he'll tell you about his close encounter. It's <laughs> awesome. a good story. <laughs> oh, hey. <laughs> she can't hear you because I have headphones. <laughs> Chloe, that's very naughty. Go down. You go down. I'll be down in a minute. You could go. Okay, guys. I should. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for coming on, Dean. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll be back next week with a new guest. Everybody have a good week.